Thanks for tuning into the Owl's Nest. Ladies and gentlemen, we had a hell of a weekend of Overwatch. Both finals for the Summer Showdown were out of this world, and we'll break them all down for you right here. That's coming up today on the Owl's Nest. Welcome back to all of our regulars, and hello to any new viewers. If this is your first time visiting the Owl's Nest, make sure you hit that subscribe button and like the video. Leave some comments, and we might even read them here on the show. So the Summer Showdown is in the books, and we have both of our champions here. Two matches that will not soon be forgotten. And uh, I'd like to start with the Paris versus Philadelphia match, the one that had me up all day. It was one of those moments where, like, when we went all the way to the Game 7. I was waiting for it to end. I'd, I had so much Overwatch that weekend, but I still wanted more. I had to see how far it could go. Jake, this was just a match of absolutely epic proportions. Did you think that we would go quite this far and that Paris would be the one to walk away with the win. Honestly, after Paris beat the Shock, I, I thought they were going to win it. Uh, to be honest, I, I didn't, I wasn't sure that Philly would be able to put up this level of fight after I watched Paris really? versus Shock. I mean, I thought Shock was going to be the champion. So I thought, you know, uh -huh. when Paris beat the Shock, that's it. Like they're going to be, you know, with, with how hard the Shock dominated Philly sort of recently, I wasn't sure, um, you know, how Philly would look. But Philly, you know, on the back of a ridiculous performance from EQO, a player who hasn't seen a ton of playtime this season, you know, he's been a little bit out of the meta, right? There's been a ton of double hit scan meta or Widow Tracer, that sort of thing. So we really haven't seen too much of EQO. And when we did, you know, he was he was on things like the May, uh, you know, not playing like the super high impact carry role um, where he is on the Genji. But man, did, did he just look better than ever on the Genji? A real bright spot, um, you know, for the Philly Fusion squad. And yeah, seven games. Super close, back and forth. You just can't ask for more than this out of a series. You know, there, there actually was, uh, uh, going into it, I had a little bit of doubt right at the very beginning on that first match when they had subbed in Soon and Nico over Sparkle and Xe. I thought at first, I'm like, oh, you know, are they, they maybe played a little bit too much because after a five-game series against the Shock, I don't know how you then go into a seven-game versus the Philadelphia Fusion and, like, keep up, you know, your, 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 your mental focus there. But, uh, I mean, you know, you, you, you had mentioned EQO, and I definitely think that the, the Genji was definitely the big narrative here all throughout the weekend. The big Genji plays were amazing. What do you think the edge was that Paris had when it came to Sparkle versus EQO in the Genji matchup? Honestly, I don't think that's where the edge was for the Eternal, right? I think both Genjis had great games. Uh, mm -hmm. Genji's just not a hero that typically interacts too much with the other Genji. So it's not like a Widow duel where, you know, dominating the Widow duel usually means that is like a 1v1 that's going your way that's very like 1v1 skill based the genji battle is sort of a proxy war right like you're both mostly focusing on farming the enemy tanks for blade and then the when you actually blade a genji is like your worst target because he can not only deflect and, and block your strikes uh but he can like dash away you know it's very very awkward to actually kill an enemy genji with your blade generally that's not going to happen um so you're usually aiming for supports first then, you know, like players like the Widowmaker, the Ash, like the backline hit scan, uh, and then the tanks. And like your Genji is honestly your last target. So I think both Genjis played well. It's just not a role where it's a role where you're just trying to do more than the other Genji rather than actually trying to fight them head on. Um, so I don't think the Genji difference was really what decided this. Uh, in my eyes, this was the time for the rest of the team to step up, step up because both Genjis had great games, as I said. So uh, it was up to the rest of the team to really make the difference. I think Exe played an insane series as usual uh you know he had those awkward moments i think uh you know in the past with the wrist injury we don't we didn't know how long he'd be sitting but to see him back and especially alongside sparkle they look ridiculous together um you know i think i think hanbin in particular actually played a pretty insane game as well that was he was a player i noticed hanbin and fielder on those flex tank and flex support positions really provided a ton of value to the team definitely the quieter roles of the team like you're not going to be carrying team fights so much but it's just generating value and critically staying alive. That's where Fielder and Hanbin, I think, just did a great job. So from the Philadelphia Fusion side, then, obviously, you know, I think going in, despite the incredible performance we saw from the uh, from the Paris Eternal against the Shock, you know, uh, the Philadelphia Fusion is still our second seed. You know, they're just underneath uh, the Shanghai Dragon. So in a way, you know, first seed uh, at the time in North America. What was it that you think that they that they ended up lacking? You know, where was it they kind of fell behind that allowed the Paris Eternal, as close as it was, to edge out? I mean, man, it's so hard to say because I don't know if this is there's ever going to be like a satisfying answer to that. I think when you're in a three-four grand final, I don't know that there's ever going to be 
one player who who fell, fell behind really because if, if there was really one player who like didn't have a great game it would have been like a 4-1 you know like the right. fact that it goes that distance and it's back and forth and that the teams are trading maps and it's like i think it largely came down to map choice right the fact that you know teams are able to get their comfort map pick out that actually has a massive impact and uh you know for the paris eternal they were able to convert uh you know on philly map picks right at, at least one time so the fact that they're able to sort of flip that momentum was was kind of what ultimately decides the series and it's like it's almost unsatisfying because the real truth is that there's just a razor's edge between these teams right you have to crown one of them the champion but this sort of series just proves like how incredibly closely matched these teams are like if you see them play again in a different meta all bets are off like it's a 50 50 because um you know despite philly not coming away with the win here i, I think I don't know. For, for just watching this match, I, I felt like these are both really, really top teams. Philly, they didn't slack off. They are still a top team. They just like didn't get the win today. You know, it's, it really to me is like any given day kind of match. You know, when someone gets four road, four one, you're like, okay, well, that's probably gonna go the same way next time. <laughs> um, you know, maybe this team is just better. They're more clutch or whatever. But Philly clutched up, and even in rough situations, right? Think about that EQO crazy Genji clutch. You know, bringing things back for his team on Rialto, like. Oh, there were just I, so I, many I, I moments might, like that. There's no way they can do that on point B. Like, there's no way they can do it two times in a row. Yeah. But but I I, I think you're right. It, it, it was less about them not being really stepping up. But I think both of these teams, match after match, they found that that extra bit, you know, that extra one, two, ten percent inside to just go the distance and really push it as far as it did. Uh, you know, I think we see we saw a lot of that throughout you know, some of these upsets, some of these close matches in NA, but over on the other side of it, in the APAC region, I think it was a whole different kind of ball game. I think that, you know, right from the beginning, we saw the teams that were going to end up in the finals, right? The Guangzhou Charge, the Shanghai Dragons, even going through the qualifying, you know, the weeks of the qualifiers, both of these teams have been just absolutely stepping up their game, and you were the one who even said that, you know, Guangzhou Charge have really been surging lately, but I do think that watching this, that it, it's not quite the same sort of matchup that we saw in Paris and Philly, you know, because what I saw out of Shanghai is they had put themselves in the position a lot of times to be able to take the win. You know, uh, I believe it was on Nepal, the first map. They got to 99% on both those maps first, but then it was the charge that were able to bring it back. So what was it that you saw in this matchup that allowed the charge to put themselves in the position that they did? I think for sure charge had like a major clutch factor here of just like, like you said, like when you go down 99 to 10% or something, you shouldn't, you have no rights to win that cough round. Like it, it is, mm -hmm. the other team has a big edge. Um, I think what it came down to though, at least, you know, for the, for the way the series opened up with like 3-0 to the charge, uh, the, that just shows to me that they're just a better team on that current meta. Eileen's Genji looked really clean. Um, but more than that, I think like the tanks and supports, uh, for the charge just played so well together and they had such great synergy. Like when you win three maps in a row on the same comp, I understand why Shanghai switches it up completely and they bring in different players. They start playing the Echo Sombra. They start like just really changing it up. And I think that was a great move for them. It did give them a couple maps, but the problem is like the runway to do that, like compare this to the upset or not the upset, but the reverse sweep that uh, Dragons pulled off against the Dynasty in the last tournament. Yep. Mm -hmm. In that one, they didn't make they, they changed players, but they didn't make radical strategy changes. They were playing more or less the same strategies. Uh, just They brought in Fearless, and that was like a, a boon to them, right? Great decision. And it was this series as well. However, this series, they, they felt like they needed to actually change strategy as well. So they go to this dive comp that not many people are actually playing right now. Uh, I'm sure Shanghai practiced it. They had it in their back pocket. But they just felt like, wow, we're losing the mirror on this Arisa Sig. We need to switch it up. And it did work. It did get them a couple maps back into the series, right? But the problem is for the char like for the charge, they have so much time to adapt, right? They have so many maps to lose and just throw them away and keep picking maps and start to learn more and more about how like they might have not seen too much of the Sombra dive comp before, right? And not played against it on Nerissa Sig, but they just have t map after map after map to learn and I iterate and start keep picking maps that are hard to play that comp on. And just if you're the dragons, you just cannot make a single mistake, right? You cannot throw one single map away when you're in that position. So. I mean, that just shows how incredibly hard it is to reverse sweep like that in a, in a best of seven. Um, and for the charge, to their credit, to be able to make those little subtle adaptations in how they're approaching the game against the dive comp, uh, eventually I think the trick just wasn't enough anymore for Shanghai. I think they got some, some wins off just being better on that comp and understanding it really well on a map like Gibraltar, for instance, that actually is pretty great for that dive strategy and pretty hard to play Arisa Sigma on uh, relative to the other maps in the pool. 
But then as time goes on and charge picks map after map after map, it's just too hard for the Dragons to actually come back with the Sombra comp. It's too difficult to execute against a team that is starting to learn how to deal with you. So I know that we've you've, we've talked about this before, and in the APAC region, it's it's so close between a lot of these teams. But with the recent surge that Guangzhou has seen, do you think that this is going to signal a sort of shift in the you know the the the, the upper sort of echelons of it? I mean, the Guangzhou Chargers sitting at third seed now, uh, with only the Philadelphia Fusion between them and the Shanghai Dragons. If we take the entire league into consideration, what do you think the future of the APAC region looks like? Well, I mean, after this tournament, I do think Dragons and Charge as top two is not a stretch, really. I think those those are two teams that have looked really great, you know, regardless of the patch, regardless of the meta, they, they have looked really strong. Um, maybe the Dragons more so than the Charge, but obviously the Charge taking this win, showing that this is their meta. I mean, in my mind, unless there's really serious balance changes to the game, Arisa Sigma is going to dominate forever. Like, I just think the comp <laughs> is actually too good from a theoretical perspective in that it just denies the enemy the chance to build ultimates. And while there might be some metas, and especially with hero pools, that like take away crucial tools that, that make it too difficult to survive playing this Orisa Sigma comp where you actually might be vulnerable to getting jumped on, any comp that doesn't instantly kill the backline of Orisa Sigma is going to lose to it. Like That is the only way to win because there's no two tanks that generate more value over time than Orisa and Sigma together. Um, and what that does is it creates this meta where if you can't if you can't instantly end the fight or very very quickly end the fight like if you're at all reliant on ultimates you're going to be in big trouble like you need to have a dive comp that wins without an ultimate because if you're waiting to build ultimates then great you have an emp but they're going to have a rally and they're going to have a batiste drone and, and they might even have like a flux or you know one of their dps alts as well so you get to a point where sure you're playing dive but you're never going to farm tank ults as fast as they will it's just not possible right like if winston fully commits he's going to die so he's never able to really get that big farm that he wants. You know, same for a hero like like Wrecking Ball. Um, you know, Zarya to an extent, I think, can really struggle because you end up just breaking shields all day long while the enemy team is actually hitting your health pools. They're actually building up ultimates. So that theoretical reality that like you're just, you're not like, they're going to build ults faster than you is basically the, the game plan of Orisa and Sigma. Uh, they're, that they're not going to necessarily end the fight really quick, but they don't care. They're going to get more ults out of every fight than you get. And in the long game, playing the map fully out, they're just going to win with their ultimates. And, you know, sure, you might win some fights here and there, but it's going to be too costly for you to maintain a snowball. And they'll be able to win the fights when there's no ultimates, especially. So for the charge, what this means for them is, like, this is the comp, in my opinion, you need to dominate on. Um, and for looking at the NA region, right, If I, I think Shock is still incredibly good at this comp. I think the switch in the meta to play Genji over Tracer really hurt them. I don't think they were necessarily ready for that, at least not nearly as ready as they are for, you know, the hitscan plus Tracer. But um, but um, I still think they're insanely good at the comp. I think Philly Fusion showed that they are also strong at the comp. But I think, like, in my mind, that's what's going to decide this season. Unless there's a real serious balance patch, I think come final playoffs, it'll be Arisa Sigma to, to def decide the whole season. So for the teams right now winning tournaments on this meta or having great performances... This is like, in my opinion, the most important meta to win. Well, and if the summer showdown was any indication, we are in for an amazing rest of the season. That's going to be it for us today here on the Owl's Nest, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. Make sure you check out some of our other videos here, like our last video where we broke down some of the biggest upsets from the summer showdown. Otherwise, make sure that you're visiting CheckpointXP.com for wealth of other content, video, written, and otherwise. And make sure you're following Jake on social media. That's Jake OW on Twitter and Jake underscore OW on Twitch and YouTube. That's going to be it for us here, guys. Remember to stay on the payload. <laughs>